alcohol in higher concentrations is very destructive, particularly to our brain. And so we have to think about our relationship with alcohol. And if you're going to drink alcohol, then I recommend the same as I have done is to drink natural, organic, low alcohol wine. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, everybody. I'm your host, Hilda Labrata Gore. This is episode 209, and our guest today is Todd White. Todd is a biohacker a self-described health evangelist, and the founder of Dry Farm Wines. With over 15 years of experience in the wine industry, Todd has important insights into what we are putting into our wine glasses night after night. He is a leading authority on healthy, organic, natural wines, and he is committed to helping us unlock the best way to enjoy alcohol while avoiding the negative outcomes. In our conversation today, he begins with a look at what winemakers are actually putting into the wine that we drink, besides fermented grapes. He discusses the ramifications of the additives, some of which are toxic, and he covers the difference between organic and natural wines. He also offers guidance for all those who eat clean and want their wine to align with their food and lifestyle choices. Before we dive into the conversation, a quick shout out to our sponsors, New Trends Publishing. Buy amazing books on diet and health at New Trends Publishing. New Trends is the home of Sally Fallon Morell's seminal book, Nourishing Traditions, as well as her latest books, Nourishing Diets and Nourishing Fats. Go today to NewTrendsPublishing.com for these and other amazing books on diet and health. And Ancestral Supplements with Grass-Fed Colostrum. Colostrum is mother's first milk, fundamental nourishment that provides all of the essentials to thrive as a healthy animal in nature. It is loaded with immune and growth factors and protective proteins. Go to ancestralsupplements.com and order yours today. You'll find a range of products made from New Zealand sourced, nose to tail organ meats, bone marrow, and colostrum, and simple convenient gelatin capsules. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Todd. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. I have some dirty, dark secrets about the wine industry. Tell us one right off the bat because you've already got me intrigued. Well, there's 76 additives approved by the FDA for the use in winemaking. And the reason you and your audience probably don't know about those 76 additives, and four of them are very toxic, is because there's not a contents label on wine bottles. Now, there's a reason for that. This is one of the dark secrets that the wine industry has. So the wine industry has spent tens of millions of dollars in lobby money in Washington to keep contents labeling off of wine bottles. Mm. It's the only major food product without a contents label. And the reason they don't have a contents label is because they don't want you to really know what's in it. And I'm going to tell you some of the things that are really in it. Yeah. And before you do, I just want to say this reminds me of the beauty industry, right? Because they say that they are like patented trademark secrets of what the ingredients are in their beauty products. And that that may be so in part, but it's also in part with intention so that the public doesn't know what all is in their creams and lipsticks and stuff. Yeah. It's the same thing that's happening in the food supply. You know, what's happened over the course of the last few decades, the last two decades in particular, really sort of started the 1980s. You had massive corporate consolidation fueled by money and greed. Same things happened in the beauty industry. Same thing has happened in our food supply. Same thing has happened in the wine supply. And so you've got these massive marketing organizations fueled by private equity and hedge funds that have just bought everything up. So here's how it works. 52% of all the wines manufactured in the United States are made by just three giant companies. And 70% of the wines manufactured in the United States are made by the top 30 companies. So here's what they want you to believe. They're very smart, so they hide behind tens of thousands of labels and brands. But Mm -hmm. these are really just these massive manufacturing conglomerates, right? And so they want you to believe 
They're going to tell you the story in magazine ads and on television. And what they want you to have you to believe or from the label is that you're drinking from a farmhouse or a chateau. When in fact, in most cases, when you buy a bottle of wine at retail, you're drinking from massive wine factories located in Central California. Mm, That does remind me of the food industry. We think we're getting our nice little steak from some charming little farm around the corner because there's a picture of that on the label when in reality it's coming from some concentrated animal feeding operation. Well, that and the same thing with industrial farming all over the world, right? I mean, everything is grown. Uh, most everything, if you're not buying at the farmer's market, even when you go, I would give you this example. And this describes well the difference between a wine quality from truly a natural small family farm and that, quote, organic wine that you might see at Whole Foods. So when you go into Whole Foods, right, and you Mm -hmm. see all this organic vegetables, right, in the produce department, they don't look anything like what you see at the farmer's market. So when you go to the farmer's market and you deal with a small organic family farm, you see these vegetables are so photogenic. They're just like beautiful and vibrant and teeming with color and they look so nutritious, right? They don't look like the organic vegetables that you see in Whole Foods. Those are what I call industrial organic, right? Right. And there's a big difference in an industrial organic product and a family farm product. So all, you know, the wines that we sell and drink um, it are, are all from small family organic farms like that. And that illustrates, you know, exactly the difference what I'm talking about in the vegetables, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and anybody who's been to a farmer's market knows what that looks and feels like. Well, the same thing is true for, for grape farming or whether it's organic or not. The question is, you know, at what point does it become kind of mass produced. I mean, there's tremendous mass production in organic farming today, right? And that's very different than, very different than the love, the love of soil. See what really makes a beautiful grape and what really makes for a beautiful vegetable is living soils. The importance of living soils is what, that's what the family farm really focuses on. It's the single most important element is the life and the quality of the soil, right? right. And so that's where, of course, the soil's not being poisoned with glyphosate, which is the active ingredient Roundup or other chemicals, but it's much bigger than that. So like natural farmers oftentimes don't even really till their soil or turn the soil because they want to preserve the living organisms, the millions of living organisms that are beneath the soil doing the work of keeping the soil aerated and healthy, Mm -hmm. right? And so when you turn that soil over and it faces the sun, you kill all of those organisms, right? And so when you go to a natural farmed organic vineyard where grapes are grown, there's no tasting room like you would go to in California. There's, it's nothing like that. The, the very first thing the farmer does, they want to take you to the vineyard. They want to spend an hour or two with you talking about the soil, yeah. showing you the soil, picking it up, having you feel it and smell it. And they want to show you the, the, the insects. And, you know, they, they, they want to talk about biodiversity and, and how all of the universal nature is all connected, that's really their interest. And that's the reason that when you go to the farmer's market, that's the reason you see that the vegetables look different than just your standard organic, right? Because right. Then there's been this deep obsession with, with biodiversity and that all of nature is connected to itself and to spiritual energy. And that's how farmers think. And it's funny because I've never thought to apply any of this to wine. Right. Well, they, look, the same thing is happening in wine is the same thing is happening in food. You've got all of this industrial farming. Look, wine is grown, not made. And that's a very important concept. In, in the United States and then everything you see in your grocery store, that wine is made, not grown. But natural wines are grown, not made, because nothing happens to them in the cellar other than a natural fermentation process using wild native yeast. And so on the skin of every grape in wine grape in the world, there's yeast on the skin. It's collective, it's collected wildly. It's indigenous to the vineyard where the, where the grape is grown. So if you picked on any wine grape, if you picked a cluster of 
of relatively ripe grapes from a wine grape and you threw it into a bucket, it would begin to firm, assuming the temperature was high enough, right? Mm -hmm. it, the temperature has to be correct. So, but assuming that it's warm enough, you will begin a fermentation process right there in the bucket because the two ingredients that are needed to create fermentation are contained already in the grape. One is yeast and the other is sugar. So are you telling me that when they make wine, let's say on this industrial level, as we've been discussing, they add yeast? It's not natural yeast? Absolutely. Is that one of the additives? That's exactly what happens. So the first thing, the first thing an industrial winemaker does, he's not a wine grower, he's a winemaker. The first thing the winemaker does is he introduces sulfur dioxide, it's an additive, to the wine to kill the native yeast. And then he inoculates with a genetically modified lab-grown commercial yeast. Now, there are three reasons why he does that instead of using the native yeast that's present. With native yeast, they're very temperamental, right? They're, they're, yeah. they're nature. You can't make wine in great quantities with them. And they, they need a lot of coddling. These commercially grown genetically modified yeast are modified to be very sturdy and easy to work with. The other two reasons are that a lab-grown yeast will withstand a much higher alcohol environment than a native yeast, right? And wines are increasingly high in alcohol. We can talk about that in a moment and why that's happening and why that's not healthy for you. So when you see a commercial yeast product, you know, one of the attributes of the product is it withstands a high alcohol environment, up to 20% alcohol. Native yeast will die around... 15 and, a, 15 and a half. So they'll withstand a higher alcohol environment. And then the third reason is they've been modified to have certain flavor profiles. And what I mean by that is let's just say you, you grow some, some pretty terrible industrially farmed grapes in Central California, but you want to make a wine that tastes like it's from Italy, they uh -huh. have a yeast for that. Oh, kind of like the uh, special flavorings that the chemists cook up to make a chip taste good to us. Exactly. So, so th this is what's really happening behind the curtain. And, you know, which I've told this story to a few million people. I mean, it's <laughs> in, in terms of, you know, what's, what's really going on. But let me come back to alcohol because this is a super important topic for anybody who's concerned about their health. And that certainly applies to us. I mean, we're health fanatics. Yeah, I just happen to love drinking wine. As I mentioned, I've been drinking wine since I was nine years old. I've been a lifelong wine lover. But I found once I became ketogenic about five years ago, before keto was as fashionable as it is today, I'd been a biohacker for a long time. Once I became keto, I couldn't drink commercial wines anymore. I thought it was just the alcohol, but it turns out it was a lot more than that. But let me talk about alcohol for a moment. Yeah. Now, you know, I sell wine. I have a wine company called Dry Farm Wines. We are the largest seller of natural organic wines in the world. And we sell to a health-focused audience. And that's, that's kind of our niche. That's what we do. We do independent lab testing. And we have this whole protocol, which people can see on our website if they're interested. Mm -hmm. But here's the reason I mentioned my role there as the founder of this wine company is because it surprises people to hear the wine guy say alcohol is a very dangerous neurotoxin. Alcohol is a super destructive drug. Oh, so, yeah, that is surprising to hear so, you say. Yeah, it's like, oh, well, the wine guy, I thought he was selling wine. I'm not here to sell wine. I'm here to educate you about how to drink if you choose to drink. And so if, if you choose to drink wine, as I do on a daily basis, and I think most of our customers are regular wine drinkers. They're, those are the people who are concerned the most about this topic and who are affected the most by it and who see the greatest improvement in their life when they start drinking natural, organic, low alcohol wines. And the reason that's really important is because alcohol in higher concentrations is very destructive, particularly to our brain. Hmm. And so if we're going to drink, and I think many people might be better off not drinking, but that's not the choice they make. The choice they make is to drink. And I would even tell you that most regular wine drinkers probably think they drink too much. And so we have to think about our relationship with alcohol. And if you're going to drink alcohol, 
then I recommend the same as I have done is to drink natural, organic, low alcohol wines. And the reason I made that recommendation in the paleo and keto movement to which we're very active in, tequila is often recommended as the drink of choice because it's distilled, which Uh I agree. It's clean. I agree. It comes from a plant. I agree. Right. All these things are good. The problem I have with it is as 45% alcohol, Uh right? Alcohol is a domino drug. And what I mean by a domino drug is that the more you drink, the more likely you are to drink more. That's the reason wines have been steadily increasing in alcohol over the last 30 years. So most wines 30 years ago were 12, 12 and a half percent alcohol. Today, they're nearly 15 percent on average in the United States. And the reason for that, there are a couple of reasons, but Americans like high alcohol wines because they're bold and they're rich. And so Americans like everything bigger, bolder, richer. (laughs) And see, alcohol adds weight and density and taste to a wine. And so with that, it satisfies the American palate, which has largely been damaged and deadened, mummified after years of overexposure to sugar and processed foods. And so when you eat clean and you're mindful and aware of the way you eat and you don't eat processed foods and a lot of sugar, your palate is more sensitive to, to, to taste and you don't want that heavy, high alcohol taste, right? If your palate's dead, you need it. But the more important reason that alcohol has risen steadily is because the wine industry likes alcohol. And why do they like alcohol? For two reasons. It's addictive. We all know that alcohol is addictive and it's a domino drug. So I'm going to give you something that's more addictive and it's going to encourage you to drink even more wine. We take a completely different approach. We say, hey, you should be able to drink wine on a daily basis or every few days or whatever your frequency of choice is, but you should drink lower alcohol wine and you should have less alcohol ingested. See, most people, their approach with alcohol, because it's a domino drug, don't have a glass of wine. They have several. So if that's the case, if you're going to have two or three glasses or a bottle or whatever, the only way to cut down the amount of alcohol that you're ingesting is to begin with a lower alcohol wine in the first place. Most of the wines I drink are between 10 and 11%. That's just the taste profile that I like and what makes me feel the best. Coming up, Todd explains why beer is particularly problematic for our health. And here's a hint. It has to do with the type of sugar it contains. And he also reveals another dirty little secret of the wine industry related to labeling and alcohol levels. You're listening to the Wise Traditions podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. New Trends Publishing. Go to newtrendspublishing.com for the latest and best health and diet books. These include Sally Fallon Morell's popular Nourishing Traditions cookbook, along with her latest books, Nourishing Fats and Nourishing Diets. There is also a Nourishing Traditions cookbook for children. The kids in your family will love this spiral-bound, fully illustrated version of Nourishing Traditions. They'll learn to make everything from crispy nuts to friendly ferments. It's available at bookstores, online booksellers, and of course at newtrendspublishing.com. And with holidays approaching, you should consider buying a group of books. Case orders are 50% off at newtrendspublishing.com. And Ancestral Supplements. Grass-fed colostrum by Ancestral Supplements. There are many ancestral records of praise given for colostrum throughout history. For thousands of years, Ayurvedic practitioners have used colostrum for its healing benefits. And in India, cows are still considered sacred animals. Hieroglyphic texts show that colostrum was used by the ancient Egyptians as well. Every mammal's birthright is to receive colostrum as its first food. Colostrum, which is the mother's first milk, is the fundamental nourishment that provides all the essentials to thrive as a healthy animal in nature. It is loaded with immune and growth factors and protective proteins. It is not only essential to mammals in the wild, but it helps us to build and maintain a robust immune system and supports gut growth and repair. 
So visit AncestralSupplements.com to see what they can do for you. Ancestral Supplements, putting back in what the modern world has left out. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. The, the thing is, you know, I'm a drinker, and I'll freely tell you I have a tenuous relationship with alcohol. That's why I'm in this business. That's how I got in the business. I choose to drink. My life might be better without it. I couldn't tell you. I haven't stopped drinking. <laughs> but I love wine. I don't love alcohol. And so that's the reason it's just really important for us to think about, you know, how we approach the consumption of wine. And the reason I say low alcohol wines as opposed to spirits, because the only other choice in standard beverages below that is going to be ciders or beer. And they both contain a lot of sugar and beer is particularly poisonous, not only because of its gluten content. Now, there are gluten free beers out there, but the problem is beer contains a very specific type of sugar called maltose sugar, Mm -hmm. and that sugar converts instantly to fat in the liver. Not all sugars are processed the same as you're probably aware. Maltose converts immediately to to, to fat, which is the reason that you have the beer gut and this kind of abdominal fat associated with beer drinkers is because of the type of sugar that's contained in it that quickly converts to abdominal, very unhealthy abdominal fat, which surrounds your organs. So, you know, beer's off the table for a number of reasons and then Mm -hmm. spirits for the reasons I've already talked about. And then that leaves kind of wine in the middle. But then the choice you make in wine really makes a huge difference. So tell us another secret of the wine industry, Todd. Well, the alcohol stated on a wine bottle. Most people Uh probably don't pay much attention to it. Yeah, I don't think that until they start thinking about it because nobody's ever told them to think about it. Right. But the alcohol stated on a wine bottle is not required by law to be accurate. And the reason that happened originally was the, the law was written post-prohibition in the 1940s when lab testing for alcohol could vary from lab to lab. So the wine industry was given this kind of wiggle room. The stated amount on the bottle didn't have to be accurate. Well, Today, the technology is quite clear and and it, it's quite exact from lab to lab, but the, but the wine industry doesn't want this removed because the wine industry wants to round down the alcohol stated on the bottle. There's two key reasons for that. By law, it can be one and a half percent lower than what's stated. So if it says 14 on the bottle, it could be 15 and a half percent. The reason they want to round it down is they want the appearance of less alcohol, but more importantly, the excise tax that they pay to the federal government is based on the alcohol content. The higher the alcohol content, the higher the tax they pay. Oh, I didn't know that. Well, there's lots. You mean the wine industry and Washington, (laughs) D.C. are in bed together. Um, I mean, as a lot of industries are. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not contained to the wine business. This just happens to be a topic that I'm an, I'm an expert in. I mean, it's, it's across all industries, you know, pharmaceuticals, yeah. food, beauty. You know I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's across everything, but this just happens to, happens to be the one I know about. Well, let me ask you a question. So I have a friend who likes her wine now and then, and she will choose wines that are labeled organic and she still gets a headache and doesn't feel good. And she's like, how is this happening? Is it because of what you were saying earlier that it's, a whole different fermentation process, and there are additives that may not even be revealed even on an organic wine? That is correct. So organic wines only mean the fruit was organically farmed. It doesn't mean that it was uh, fermented with wild native yeast, which we think is a big deal. It doesn't mean that it was not irrigated. It may be organically farmed, but that that's where the, the process changes and it becomes goes from wine growing to now wine making. So if it's, I don't care even if it's biodynamically farmed, if it is industrially produced, meaning in large volume, as most wines are, they have additives in them. They're not being fermented with native yeast. They um, they are high in sulfites. They are probably high because of the wine style and the way wines are made, particularly in the United States. They're probably high on biogenetic amines, and this gives a lot of people headaches. 
Biogenetic amines, the two offenders are tyramine and histamine. And women are particularly vulnerable to side effects from these amines. So there's a whole lot to know. Just or just because it's organic doesn't mean that it's natural or additive free. And there's no requirement of any kind to disclose anything on the bottle other than the stated alcohol percentage. Wow. So there's a lot of leeway with what people can do and how they want to label. Well, we already know that, like you said, just in the um, regular food industry, it's true as well. It can say natural or natural flavorings on a package of food. And you think, well, that's good. And <laughs> not realizing what that can represent. Look, the only way, the only way to know what's in a wine is to acquire your wine from somebody who lab tested, right? That's what we do. You know, we lab test every wine. So we're the only company in the world that does that. If you want to know what's in it and you want to know what the quantifications are, then you, the only way to know that and sugar, we haven't even talked about sugar. Right. So sugar can range from zero, which is our wines. What made me think about that is sugar is something we lab test for, right? Because, we're sugar-free, we're keto, paleo, we don't want to eat sugar. And so I certainly don't want to drink sugar in my wine. Commercial wines commonly contain sugar, ranging from, you know, five to 10 grams per liter to as high as a couple of hundred grams per liter. And that would be for dessert wines and very noticeably sweet wines. But wine can contain, you know, 10 to 50 grams of sugar per liter, and it won't taste that sweet. The only way to know if a wine is sugar-free, even for taste professionals like us, the only way to know is to lab test it. So I love that you test your wine so thoroughly. I wish everybody would <laughs> because you're right. All of us in this health sphere really want to put the best into our bodies and we want to be careful about what we're exposing ourselves to. Talk to me a minute about sulfites. Should we care about those? Well, everybody should care about sulfites, but let me... Sulfites are largely misunderstood and get blamed. Sulfites get blamed for a lot they're not guilty of. But all fermented foods, including wine, all fermented foods contain sulfites. Sulfites are naturally occurring in the fermentation process. Sulfites are found all over food products of all different descriptions and colors, from dyed, dried fruits to sauerkraut. They have sulfites in them. Now, uniquely, wine bottles for, again, a, a government issue, wine bottles are required, all wine bottles are required to say contain sulfites. And this, we won't get into how that ended up on a wine bottle, but it was meant to discourage people from drinking. Oh, right. Yeah, I've seen that on there. Yeah. So, but, but all wines, any wine, any fermented food contains sulfites. That being said, the question is, is additional sulfur dioxide, which is a chemical additive sterilizer preservative, is sulfur dioxide added to the wine to sterilize and preserve it? Wine, up until it's sterilized, is still a living thing, right? It's alive. It has bacteria in it. Gut-friendly bacteria. Dr. David Perlmutter just did a post on our wines and their gut-friendly bacteria that are friendly to the microbiome. Because they haven't been sterilized, these bacteria are still living in the wine. So this is another reason that natural wines, meaning those without sulfur dioxide, are healthier for you. We understand this. In the Wise Traditions and Weston Price Circles, we talk a lot about the benefits of raw dairy products, for example. I know not all of our sure. paleo and keto friends get into this, but we believe that raw milk has act well, I know, it has active enzymes and bacteria that are really good for you. And when you pasteurize that milk or that cheese, you are killing the good and the bad, and it ends up with a being a completely different product. So when you're talking about this, we know what you're talking about. We would rather see it an unsterilized wine, if you will, than one that is made sterile. Exactly. In, in the way you're describing. It's true. It's true. You know, there's so much to talk about, so many things we don't have time to cover, but I mean, those are some of the highlights I think that are that are interesting for people to think about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I have two questions as we start to wrap up, Todd. Number one, how is it that you started drinking at nine years old? I just have to ask you that. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I was just very curious. And my parents were, you know, allowed me to taste 
wine products when I was about nine. Not drink. Mm-hmm. I would have become a drinker at nine, but <laughs> started tasting wine in very uh, small quantities, particularly around holidays. I see. I see. And so what advice, this will be my last question now, what advice would you give those who do want to drink wine and include that as part of a healthy yeah. lifestyle? Well, I, you know, for the reasons we've already described, I, I think it's important to drink natural wines. And unlike in the food category, natural wines are a specific protocol and everybody's pretty much in agreement on what those protocols are. And so when someone says they make natural wine and you can do an internet search for natural wines, if you live in a large market like New York or San Francisco or Chicago, Los Angeles, there are natural wine retailers and there are natural wine bars and there will be like natural wine restaurants in certain markets. So you can just do an internet search for natural wines close to where you live. And wow. So I would focus on natural wines and inside that, looking for lower alcohol wines. I, that would be my first recommendation. Outside of that, then I just focus on, you know, European wines um, at, just at lower alcohol. And, you know, once you get the lower alcohol, you're going to be taking a a huge step forward. Awesome. Well, that is great advice. And we do wish you the best and just want to say cheers as we (laughs) as we sign off. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Our guest today was Todd White. For more from Todd and his company, visit dryfarmwines.com. You can find me on Instagram at Holistic Hilda and on my Holistic Hilda YouTube channel. For the show notes for this and every episode of the Wise Traditions podcast, go to our website, westonaprice.org and check out the podcast page. And that's it. Thanks for listening, everybody, and see you soon. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.